Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 25th of October. And as always, before we get going, if this is useful, please go ahead and give this video a like, subscribe, comment, and share. So this week, a number of new videos, I posted part seven um, of the Azure Masterclass. This was all about virtual machines and virtual machine scale sets. Uh, really go into a lot of detail about all of those capabilities and i posted kind of a dedicated video just about custom roles walking through resource providers resources the actions and how we can kind of really bring all of those things together now in terms of what's new so for storage azure sql database general purpose so that's not like the business critical tier where I actually have multiple instances of my data replicated on multiple instances of SQL database that replicate between them. This is where there is just one instance that's actually active for my data. And the way it typically works is, well, if that goes down, if there's a problem, it fails over to another instance that has some spare capacity because my data is separate. So what's been introduced, there is now a zone redundant option. So really what you can think about, remember availability zones are separate facilities within a region with independent calling power communications. So now what we can think about, imagine we kind of have those three zones within a region. And now if I turn on this zone redundant option, I still have kind of my active my kind of SQL instance there. But my data, my logs, is now stored, if I think about the storage, it's now going to be stored on a zone redundant, a ZRS. So the three copies of my data are now kind of distributed over the three zones. Well, so now if something happened to that entire zone, now there are many other instances kind of sitting around that have some spare capacity. So if I go down, what it will actually now do is, hey, my particular instance that was previously connected to my data, well, it will kind of spin up that instance on another box that has some spare capacity and connect to my data. So now I've got resiliency from kind of a zone level failure. So it's just um, some better redundancy options for me. Now, just for general purpose, for the, the business critical, et cetera, I could already have that kind of zone resiliency by having the instances with their own copies of data spread over zones. They're miscellaneous. So some really exciting things all around Azure Key Vault. Remember, Azure Key Vault is that solution where we can store certificates, um, keys, and secrets. And what we now have is this role-based access control option. So previously, we had policy. And with policy, we could say, well, these people had these rights to secrets, to keys. But I couldn't be secret or key or specific, certificate specific. I either had permission to all of the secrets or none of them. Well, now I can actually do role-based access control at a per secret, a per key um, level. So let's actually take a look at this. So if we jump over to the portal, this has been a bit bigger. Okay, so if I go and look at my key vaults, firstly, if we look at kind of my old key vault, and if we look at kind of access policies, well, I had this policy where I could kind of give a user permissions, but it wasn't secret specific. I could see them all or nothing. But now you have this kind of Azure role-based access control option. So if I go to my RBAC vault, we can see I've now got that turned on. So there are no policies to configure. Now I actually have access control. Now I'm just using roles at this point. So I could set these at a subscription, a resource group, or even an individual secret. Now what I had to do initially was so I could even see secrets or create them, I gave myself the key vault administrator permission on this resource, so this particular key vault. 
And what we can actually do is if we dive in, you'll see I can actually create my own custom roles if I wanted to. Now we can look at the Key Vault resource provider and actually see at the data level, which is really what we're kind of caring about here. Well, I can see there's keys, there's certificates, and there's secrets. If I was to go and look at secret, for example, well, now there's distinct actions for all the different types of thing I can do. So I can create roles with different combinations. And they have these built in. If I actually go back up for a second, and if we look at the other roles, we'll see they provide us roles that maybe can just read. So I can see there's things like Key Vault contributors, but there's Key Vault readers, there's Key Vault secrets users. In fact, let's look at that one. Look at the permissions. And what we'll see here is, well, this only has secret permissions and it can only get them and read them. It can't do anything else. So this very granular capability now. So what's super cool is, yes, I can set it at the resource level, but at individual secrets, so let's say look at secret one, secret one has its own access control, so I can give a user just access to this secret. So here you can see Bruce Wayne, he can read this secret. If I look at my other secret, well, you can see on this one, it's Clark Kent. So I can now have different users with different roles at a secret level. So this really gives me a lot more power so I don't have to create different key vaults anymore. If I need different people to have different permissions, I, I can just do it at that kind of attribute, that data item level. So this is actually huge. This really does change the game for a lot of things. Then they introduced Azure Policy for Azure Key Vault. So now I can think about, well, with my organization, I need these certain types of encryptions used for this certificate. Um, my secrets must expire over a certain duration. And I want to know if they're older than a certain age. There's all these different things I can do. Well, now there's Azure Policy. I can drive all of that. Maybe it's just for audit purposes I want to know. Maybe it's even I'm going to stop things if you don't set an expiry for this secret or you don't use the right kind of encryption for a certificate. So once again, if we jump back over to this, so this time we'll actually go and look at policy. Now again, both of these are in preview right now. But if I go and look at policy and I look at my definitions, you can actually already see I've got a secret should have expiration and I'm non-compliant. If I actually look at that, It'll actually show me the two kind of resources I have. Well, they actually have a bunch of things that are not compliant in there, and I can actually see them. They don't have an expiry. So already I can see, well, okay, that, that's pretty cool. But if we go to the definitions, I could search, for example, for um, secret. So secret should have a content type set. They should have an expiration date. Um, should have more than a specified number of something, I don't know what that is, of days before expiry. You have all these options, and when I actually go and, for example, assign one of these, what you'll actually see is I have a parameter what the effect is. We can see here the default is audit, but I could change it. So I could actually make it a deny as part of the assignment. If I go in here and actually assign it, for the parameter, you can see I could actually change it. I can actually stop them being able to actually create that secret that doesn't meet my requirement. Likewise, I could go and look at certificates. Oh, wrong place. So I can see there's a whole bunch of previews around certificates should use allowed key types. That's kind of that example I was talking about. Should have specified lifetimes. I can do exactly the same for keys. So now we have all of these different options around policy, 
to help make sure I'm really doing what I need to be doing in my organization around what are super important things. We use Key Vault to store secrets, keys, certificates, and those expiries really are important to make sure we're doing that. So now I can use Azure Policy. Azure Key Vault again now has Event Grid integration. So remember, Event Grid, the whole point of this is there's tons of different things in Azure that can do things. And many of them I can trigger certain hooks, different types of service can hook into different types of things. But it might be different for each type of service, things like functions and logic apps, something that's event driven, might only understand certain types of thing, and I have to all define them all over the place. So the point of event grid, it can tie into a huge number of different types of um, event generating objects. Could be like, hey, so you write a blob. Um, you do something to a key, to a secret. There's something else, something else happens, and then it can drive, other things can kind of subscribe to the events from event grid and do something. I could have a logic app or a function or, or many other things that now don't have to worry about what's creating the event. They can just subscribe to the events through event grid. Well, now Key Vault, can actually be one of these sources of events that event grid understands and can now send those events to things that subscribe to those types of events think about something like i have a secret in key vault that maybe has a shared access signature that gives me access to a storage account in the past we had to write something in our app to maybe go and check periodically to see if that has changed well now key vault could actually through event grid fire a hey the secret's been updated the app would receive that go and get the new sas and carry on working just fine so that integration with event grid is really going to make things a lot simpler for things that integrate and use key vault now it can just get told subscribe to that and we'll know straight away and can react and there's a new log analytics linux agent uh, it supports Python 3. There's a bunch of new distributions that are supported. There's a new troubleshooting tool. Um, there's kind of a readme file that goes through all of the specific changes. And Windows Virtual Desktop is now available in government locations. The Azure Modular Data Center. Uh, you probably saw this. So this is actually fairly interesting. So what we have now is this idea that hey, you need more than just like an Azure Stack Hub, more than just this kind of turnkey appliance. What you'll actually be able to do is have this huge thing, this crate delivered to your location, so it can be super tightly integrated with your networking, etc., and give you all of those kind of cloud computing and storage capabilities that you need. So you're going to get this massive container delivered to your location you can even connect by things like satellite and now you get this massive amount of azure just available to you and um, this picture is from the one i just stored in my garden but that's now available so we have that azure modular data center azure ad administrative units has gone generally available I actually just did a video about this. This is the idea that ordinarily with Azure AD, it, it's a flat structure. So when I have a role in Azure AD, it essentially applies to everything. Administrative units enable me to create these administrative units that I can kind of add users or groups to, and then I can assign a role at that scope. So instead of them having the role at the entire Azure AD, it's only for the users and the group objects. Remember, it doesn't give you permission to the users in the group. It's just I can manage the group. Otherwise, I could elevate permissions by adding people into a group that I manage. Then I'd be able to manage the people. Maybe it's an admin, change their password, and woohoo. So instead, groups I add in here, it's just I can manage the group. I have the role for the group not the people in the group. I have to explicitly add the people. So that administrative unit capability has now gone generally available. And Azure AD continuous access evaluation has now gone public preview. 
So this is the idea, I can almost use this same picture, that ordinarily we have kind of our identity provider, Azure AD. We have some kind of client, and then we have some resource. In this case, it could be something like SharePoint, or Exchange Online, or Teams. And one of the things that happens is I have to give this a token. I kind of give it this access token. And I get the access token um, along with a refresh token from my identity provider. Uh, I kind of, I have to do an authentication and authorization. What this continuous access evaluation does for clients that understand it, it's really two things. One of them is it can actually get sent basic policies things like location. So it can actually do checks for the client and it can actually say no, uh, maybe the client has moved since they got their access token and it will now refuse the token. Additionally, it can also be sent events. For example, um, the account was deleted or disabled, uh, the password was changed, MFA was enabled, um, the admin revokes a bunch of things. Maybe there was elevated risk from Azure AD identity protection. Could get sent these events and invalidate the access token. Because ordinarily, I cannot revoke an access token. It's short-lived. Normally, it's kind of 60 minutes. But in that 60 minutes, I can't do anything. They can change location. They could do anything they want. That token is still good. With this continuous access evaluation, Again, it can get the policies and it can check that, oh, your IP address is different, you've moved. No, I'm not gonna accept the token anymore. Or it can actually get notified, say, hey, something's changed, I'm gonna immediately block your access, even though you still have a valid access token, go and get a new one to make sure you're still good, and then I'll kind of let you back in. So we can actually now just turn this on uh, because it's public preview. So in the portal, if I actually go and look at my Azure Active Directory, and it's gonna be under security, and you'll see this continuous access evaluation option here. If I select that, you can see I can turn on the preview, and I can select what users and groups it would actually apply to. Now, again, it's not every app would understand this. The application has to understand it. The resource has to understand it. So again, SharePoint Online, Exchange Online, Teams today will leverage this. But this is part of a standard. It's not just Microsoft doing this. This is part of the enhancements. I think it's around kind of the OAuth 2. So there are other things we'll be able to leverage this. But that's now in public preview. You can go and try that out. And that is it for this week. Um, as always, I hope this was useful, and until next week, take care.